Welcome back to Take a Leap and Transform, a new diversity journey. I'm your host, Joseph K. Muscat. Are you ready to take a leap with me? The mystery of the Gen Zs and the culture clash within the workplace among generations. I know. What does this have to do with new diversity? Well, I've been spending a lot of time looking into inclusion and attending quite a few webinars. And to be honest, I find quite a lot of similarities. I'm introducing this week's guest, Trevor Brunches. He's a new diversity coach who teaches Gen X business owners how to hire and retain Gen Z employees. Trevor Brunches is a coach and leadership development expert with over 30 years experience as a business owner. I believe, or should I say he believes, that a good business makes for great communications by helping owners become more profitable with a positive impact in our world. Welcome, Trevor. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are today. Absolutely. And you happen to be in Canada, and particularly in the British Columbia, Vancouver region. How is it there? You betcha. No, it's beautiful, as always. You know, we live in the beautiful mountains of the Rocky Mountains here, and, you know, I can't I can only, I can't say enough about being blessed about where I live and where I get to work every day in British Columbia, Canada. Fantastic. So let's talk about, or should I say, let's start off with the fact that you're not only a fellow knee divergent who has ADHD, you're also a father of a 16-year-old ADHD or son. So let's first discuss, discuss your neodivergencies. When were you sure. first officially diagnosed? I was first diagnosed when I was 47. Uh, I am now 50. Uh, so only a couple of years ago. And it's not like you kind of knew, right? Even my mother even kind of knew when I was 15, 14, 13, 12, whatever. Um, she was like, you know, you just, it just, something just doesn't click and it just doesn't, I just don't line up. And I'm grateful that, you know, she never put a ton of pressure on, but it really wasn't until I figured out that I don't learn like everybody else, that I don't, I'm not the round peg in the round hole, I'm the square peg in the round hole. And especially when it came to education, that I realized myself that I don't think like everybody else. And I, you know, lucky for me, I did that before we even had those labels, ADHD, neurodivergent, neurotypical, any of that stuff. We didn't even talk about that when, you know, 25, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we didn't talk about that. It was just, you were the kid that was easily distracted or, you know, very hyperactive or disruptive or, 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 and, you know, so when I was 17, I realized I clued in. And I got lucky. I got, I had a couple teachers that advocated for my different way of thinking. Um, once I showed them kind of, I, I, I said to them, I said, I don't think that way. I don't work that way. Can I just learn the way? And he did. And I did really, really well in his class. And then he became an advocate for me with the other teachers. And so that made my grade 11, 12 year a lot easier. Um, and then beyond that, I've always been that creative guy that, you know, jumps around from job to job that, you know, learns quickly, does things quickly, um, can focus like crazy and work like crazy for 24 hours straight. And then, you know, or, and then on the flip side of that, some of them would probably call me lazy because, you know, those are the downtimes of it. But um, again, I've been lucky in my professional career as a coach and all sorts of other things um, that my neurodivergence is, is, is a blessing. I like to tell people that we are just wired different. I advocate for my child, my own child. He's not broken. He's not, there's nothing to be fixed. He's just wired differently than everybody else. And, and so I bring along that understanding to business owners and like yourself, there's a lot of similarities between the neurodivergent and the Gen Z. And I think it's, you know, it's awareness. Um, we're more aware of, of our differences. So I think we have 
an, an opportunity here that we have more diagnosed neurodivergence um, going into the workplace as Gen Zers uh, or Zillennials or anybody under the age of 35. And yeah, there's lots of lots of things. But yeah, I, I diagnosed, I've you know had many, many careers, many successful careers. I've done really, really well. My creativity has kept me going. Um, and, but yeah, it wasn't until I was actually 47 that I was diagnosed officially as ADHD. Well, that's really interesting. And I want to go back to that, but before I do, I don't want to lose my train of thought because you, you said something that is <clears throat> really, I personally find profound is that we're now in a generation that is of more awareness. And I think we know when we take a look back at the eighties and nineties and, and the early two thousands, there was this this complete lack of awareness and people kind of struggling and stumbling through. And now we're at this point, you know, where, well, why, why is there now all of a sudden this huge spike of, of people coming out diagnosed with ADHD and autism and what have you. And it's because, well, we went through a bit of a dark age and now we're kind of in the point of, of, of enlightenment you know, particularly with within the those with the generation that came afterwards, who become more self aware, and and because of that, we're starting to see this huge spike of individuals saying, "Well, wait a minute, I am neurodivergent," especially particularly in in situations like yours where there is this late diagnosis. And coming back to that, um, okay, you you kind of highlighted a couple points there. Everybody kind of knew that you were different. Your mother knew and said, okay, this is, this is Trevor. This is who he is. But no one came out and said, you know, perhaps you should get diagnosed for ADHD. And it's also interesting in, in this situation in regards to your schooling. And I find this to be somewhat the case, not always, but there ha tends to be at least one or two teachers who, who understand you and then be kind of become your advocate. So this is really interesting. So my two questions here then from, from what you've described, Trevor, is one, why do you think that despite all these potential signs, no one came out and said, you know, Mrs. Brunches, maybe we should get your son diagnosed for ADHD. And then we need to the second question, you know, okay, 34, 30, 20, uh, 23 or um, I'm, miscalculating here but a number of years later yeah, yeah. you come to and you said you said to yourself you know whether looking in the mirror or talking to somebody that i'm going to go get a diagnosis what led to that diagnosis so going back to the first question why was it missed sure I, it wasn't a thing we didn't talk about it i mean you can go back and look at my report cards he's a good kid he's just easily distracted but when he does put his mind to something holy smokes the output's incredible um, and that's very typical of any neurodivergent ADHD year. Uh, it, 33 years ago, we didn't have, and I live in very rural British Columbia, uh, you know, we didn't have the doctors and we didn't have the psychiatrists, psychologists. We didn't have those people, you know, I think it was just even just a thought in the, psycho in the psychology community that ADHD, hyperactivity, you know, that this was all linked to something. So I don't, I don't even think that even if my mom took me to the doctor and said, there's something wrong with him, Ritalin wasn't even a thing. I don't think Ritalin was a thing until 10 or 12 years later that you heard of, oh, we're putting our kids, these hyperactive kids on Ritalin. And, and then that became a thing. Um, but that was long after I was already out of school. Even after I left high school, my mom said to me, she goes, you know, we really should have found you like, alternate learning mm. a way that you could have flourished in a different community because the the school the, the 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 classroom just didn't suit you and she just realized this and i think there's part of that is that she sees a little of me and her mm. um so you know as a 88 year old lady who might be a little adhd uh or or have some sort of you know wiring uh maybe she sees that and, and that was the the love that she could give me is that you know maybe that wasn't the right route for you but we did the best we could and now now you're in the real world and and you go forward so i think that's why there was no diagnosis it just wasn't common i don't think and i wouldn't have had the resources locally even even if it was a commonality thing mm. uh, so you know we go to 
part two of your question and why did I get diagnosed? Well, it all has to do with my son. So I have a 16 year old neurodivergent and, you know, it's always been a struggle. He's been exactly that same kid, right? Grade one, his teacher described his desk as if a bomb went off underneath it every day. And she couldn't understand why she couldn't keep it, you know, why he couldn't keep it straight or why he was the way he was. And, you know, I started really researching it then as to, you know, what can we do for him? Uh, I advocated for a stand-up desk. I said, why doesn't he just stand up instead of sit down? And it worked really well until he was, until it didn't work for the teacher. This is the funny part with that is like, she was like, well, when, when he stands up, he sees everything. And then he points everything out to me and he's really annoying. And he, you know, and so I'm, I've taken that desk away and I'm going to force him to sit down. And I'm like, okay, that's, I mean, your, your classroom. So it wasn't until grade two for him. So he's about eight years old now. And we... And, and you've got to understand that we recognized as parents um, the, the difference in this child at the age of one. Like he was, it was early. Um, I have, he's the third, he's my third. I have a 22 and an 18 year old. And then I have this fifth, uh, 16 year old. And he was yelling at us at 12 months of age and we took him in for his 12 month vaccination. And he's just, we were like, this one's so different than the other ones. We're not sure what's going on. We're asking the nurse. So she suggested teaching him sign language so that he could communicate. So, you know, taught him more and milk and food and, and then he could communicate and he stopped yelling at us. And then at the age of three, he stuttered and four, he stuttered. Okay. What's going on here? We take him to the doctor again. And, and, and it was like, the doctor's like, you know, he's really smart. Like, you know, I can tell that there's lots of creativity and intelligence here. Um, I think his brain is just going faster than his tongue can go. We're just going to give it some time. And sure enough, he could, he doesn't, he no longer stutters. So, you know, fast forward to grade two, he's eight. And we go back to that same doctor and we go, okay, we want, we want to take this kid somewhere. We want to take this kid to a psychologist. And so we flew uh, to Vancouver and spent two, he spent two whole days with a child psychologist who did a battery of tests and came out with a 32 page. This is how, this is how your child is wired. And at least with that item, we can go to the school system and advocate for our child as ADHD. Um, there's no programming, there's no nothing for that, but at least we could say, look, he needs adaptation. There is something he's wired differently. He's not going to think like the others. Um, and so that's kind of where my diagnosis came from. I, he was on medication. Um, my wife and I, uh, our marriage didn't last through COVID, but you know, she, she's a traditionalist in there's a pill for that. <laughs> And, and I'm a little less that way. I'm more of a diet exercise kind of a thought thinker. And um, when my son started to live with me, um, and previous to that, I wanted to know what it was like to be on meds. And so I went to my own doctor and I said, okay, I filled out the ADHD um, questionnaire that they have online. And I actually just recently found it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, He's like, yeah, he goes, I easily diagnosed. He says, I, I said, I'm curious as to what the meds are like for my son. And he said, I'll give you the same medication and we'll, we'll start you at a low dose for your size and age. And we'll go from there. And that's kind of how I became diagnosed and what my thought process was towards my diagnosis. Well, well, well thank you for sharing that with us. And going back to, to the first question with your mother, um, I, mean, I mean, you already described within the first question the, that your mother had this understanding and she had this self-awareness, which, really, which is really wonderful to hear, to have a parent who, who could understand their child and relate. And the, the second part, to, um, it's, it's always funny that the parent ends up getting diagnosed because the child is also getting diagnosed and seeing a lot of those similarities. Now, you, you, you also painted a really nice picture in regards to the school system. So, I mean, coming up from, I want to make this comparison from when you were growing up, and you kind of really described, you know, that there was a lack of resources, a lack of knowledge and coming to what you've described with what your son, do you see any particular striking differences 
particularly after you know you had your son diagnosed and you presented the paper and you're being advocate and an advocate because you and I are roughly the same generation. I was diagnosed at a very young age in comparison to you. I have a a particular picture of my life of what school was like for me in regards to my diagnosis and the kind of support that I got. Um, and I'm, you know, I, A, I no longer live in Canada and B, my daughter is not in the Canadian system. Um, but I can also share the same similarities and frustration that we were seeing stuff at home that the school wasn't here locally where we finally got her privately diagnosed. So do you see anything trickling difference between when you were growing up and, and with raising your son in the school system? You know, I, I, I was always labeled, you know, as that disruptive kid. And I think, you know, mislabeled, I would like to say, mislabeled as a disruptive kid, as that, you know, distracted child, as the, you know, how many times as neurodivergent ADHD years are we told that, why are you not a little more like so-and-so who can do their work and do all of this? And, and, and it creates that heavy burden in our brain where we think that we're not good enough because we're not like those overachievers or those people that are neurotypical. And that that's what the school system is built for is neurotypicals. Um, as far as my son's concerned, having that piece of paper is just one thing, um, but we're still dealing with each teacher individually. And you, and I think that there's a certain amount of buy-in from each teacher and a certain amount of, you know, I don't have time for that uh, from each teacher as well. Uh, and, you know, after 10 years, he's going into grade 11 now, after 10 years of this, I understand his pattern. Like I wait for October 15th and I'm like, this is the point where the honeymoon period is over and the, and, and the ADHD is alive and well, <laughs> and the teacher is going, I don't know what to do. And it happens. It's happened since grade one, like it's October 15th. And then I can tell you the next day that we have a problem and it's May 1st, the sun comes out and where I live, the days get long and that vitamin D, and he just doesn't sleep. He's just, uh, you know, he's just on with the lights, which is the sun. And any learning from May 1st on is almost futile. And so some teachers get it. Some teachers don't. I think it depends on their expertise. I think it depends on their patience level. And I really think that, you know, in the Canadian system, you know, they're dealing with, you know, large class sizes of divergent and, and of, of course, a new generation of, of children too, right? Um, creating their own different problems. I, 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 yeah, I think the, the we could go on and on and on about what I think about the school system. I think we need to get away from, you know, age uh, based schooling and go back to skill based schooling. If your kid's at a grade three level of reading in grade one, he's bored. So why is he not doesn't have the opportunity to be in a grade three level? Um, the idea of progressive testing, let's test you to the point that you are, and then we can go back and see, okay, where should you be in the world in, in school? So you might have a kid that's in grade one English, grade four math, because we have those math brains and we have those English speaking, the thinking brains, and they have these other brains. You know, I wish we could go to a different style of schooling, but mm -hmm. there's no way in my generation that we're ever going to see that uh, skill based as opposed to age based schooling. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. And it's frustrating and how how rigid the education system is, as well as how rigid teachers are. I, I Living here in Malta, there is a completely different mentality. We, we're lucky that our daughter is in a private school with a which is a completely different approach, but they still have to follow the, the government regulations. Um, and it, I, I feel your frustration that with every teacher, you have to deal with them one by one. And what you described is the buy-in. Does the teacher have the buy-in? And then the teacher doesn't have the buy-in. It's their attentions are well, but at the same time, it interferes and becomes a bear to the child. My daughter is lucky in a sense that, that she's neodivergent. Uh, she's similar to me in what she has, but she's a pretty good student and able to make her way through. It's more about, you know, are the teachers aware of how to support her? 
And are the teachers aware of regarding what accommodations they have? And then on top of that, because in Malta, they're really obsessed about testing. There's this whole third party organization that's responsible for the testing and you have to go by their rules. And I'll give you a case that I had this year. One, we have a situation where we have a, a well-being, what's what I'm looking for? A, a person responsible for the well-being of students in regards to neodiversity and learning difficulties and what have you. And they send out a, a report to every teacher about, about all the students who have neodivergencies. And they advocate to the best ability for the teachers to read the material to know the student. And then comes parent teacher interview. And I'm, you know, I, I, I'm the one who does the parent teacher interviews and I'm a stickler. And like, are you aware of my daughter's neodivergent? Are you aware of this and that? He goes, oh yes, yes, I read the report. Or no, no, I, I wasn't aware. Um, no, I didn't read the report. And it becomes really frustrating. And then comes the third party, you know, so my daughter's taking a class and she's taking a class called Graphical, which basically you can relate it to the skills needed for graphic design and, and architecture. And he's not giving her extra time for tests. And it, it, and he can't because according to the governing body, which is known as MATSEC, uh, there's no extra time for, for this subject. I said, okay. So I went back to the health and well-being and I kind of put up my frustrations because why some teachers are not reading and this and that and gives me the whole ballpark explanation. I said, okay, okay. You know, but I can go, you know, you're not the only parent. I said, okay. So what about this math sec and and uh, the graphical thing? And then it, it, there was two particular subjects in regards to timing and testing. Uh, but I'll, I'll just give one one example. But but the overall thing is this: he reads me because he goes, Mister Muscat, I'm going to read you exactly what the guidelines are coming from math sec in regards to this and why this particular subject does not get extra time. And it states here that any test that is timed will not get extra time. So I paused and I said, Sir aren't all tests timed? So why is she getting extra time for some tests and not for other tests and other subjects? There's a pause. That's a very good point, Mr. Muscat. I will email Matt Sec and see what they say about this particular point because I never thought of it that way. Now, this isn't rocket science, you know, but but this is the kind of thing I have to deal with. So 24 hours later, he comes back to me and sends me an email and says, Dear Mr. Muscat, you'd be happy to know that for graphical, there will be extra time and I'll let the teacher know. Easy. <laughs> I, I I don't know what to say, you know? No, no, you know, so I'm happy to say that because of my advocacy, I've read this change, but you see what I'm saying, you know, basically oh. relating to what, what what you've described, this, this T testing, testing in the education system, neurodivergent or neurotypical, I don't care. Are you testing what they learned or how well that they can memorize content? That's it, isn't it? And that's, isn't that's the same argument I have too. Is, isn't that the thing, right? And when you say, have you read the paper? That's what happens on October 15th. Have you read his, his? we call them in, uh, uh, individual education pens, IEPs. Have you yeah. read his IEP? And they're like, no, okay then. Uh, what can I do? What, what can I tell you about Ruben? If you haven't read his IEP, you've put yourself in this position. Sorry, like, I don't know what to tell you. And and so that's the October 15th conversation. And then and then we, I don't know how many times, I have a daughter who also has a learning disability. She has a rope memory issue. Um, same psychologist, same private testing. Again, I put my children in private school for elementary. Um, and, you know, that is always my question for her is, what are you testing for? Do you want to know whether she knows the content or how well she memorized the content? Because she has a rope memory issue. So why don't you just ask her the questions verbally and see if she understands the content because she failed the test. And then they ask her the content, just have a conversation with her. So when we talk about this, what do you know about this? And she could tell them at nauseum about the answer. She learned the content. She just couldn't memorize the content and regurgitate it the way that the teacher has been programmed. Again, we're not gonna, we're not gonna reform the education system, but here are some blazing problems with it is that you know, how they function, uh, especially with the neurodivergence, um, it puts them at a huge disadvantage. And is there going to be changes on the way? Maybe, maybe not. I, I just think, I, I think in a university level too, we're at a, we're at a, a kind of a tipping point too, where is the education really worth the value? Uh, and, 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 you know, and so I think there's going to be some education reform in the next 10 to 15 years. It's education though. Teachers are think they're pretty smart and they think they're well-educated 
and they think they know a lot about that. And so I think that's going to be a slow change because of all of those types of things. There's no neuro, there's very few neurodivergent teachers, I think. Yeah. Uh, they just don't, it, it's just not something that we're going to be gravitate as far as a, a, as a calling, we're not going to be gravitated, gravitational, you know, pull towards being a teacher. I am a great teacher. I always thought, Hey, you know what? I would be an engaging, beautiful teacher, but it's the structure that I would have had a problem with. Mm. And, and 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 here I am as a business coach teaching, you know, those unintentional business owners, all the little gaps in their knowledge base based on, you know, and again, that's what my calling is. I love to teach and I love to share. Mm. And so I'm harnessing that without being a teacher uh, in the education system. I, I, I completely relate, but towards adults, I don't have patience for kids. Um, as much as I love kids, oh. I have no patience for them. Uh, but, but um uh, it's kind of funny. You're right. You know, I don't blame teachers because they're, they're a product of the system. And it's the system that's the issue. And you mentioned, you know, skills-based assessment. There's something known as project-based assessment as well. And, and educating through project-based uh, assignments, where it's a combination of things and particularly geared towards what the child likes and then inputting all the other aspects in regards to our project. So you're, you're, it's not about the testing. It's about, you know, all the elements in that project and, and ensuring that the student understands the project. And it's funny, it's, it's funny you mentioned the rote because my daughter has the same particular problem. It's, it's a working memory issue. And the second example of, of the advocacy that I had to do this year is in math. My daughter got really great marks in the first two, two particular testing. But on the third one, they have something known as math mental, which is one minute her question and in that she did horribly and it and she even says herself dad it takes me about a minute and a half to two minutes to fit to to really figure out the question so she's at a huge disadvantage and again i i challenged the well-being uh, individual at our school about th this whole aspect of this you know can you not give extra time because obviously it's having a dramatic impact and he even agreed based on the marks and he says i'll have to take it up with math sec and again, thankfully, it took about six months, but they now decided that they're going to remove math mental completely. You know, so it's that kind of advocacy, but it, it, it but it's it, it, it's just funny that you brought that up and, and that's the second example. Um, but let's move on because we can go on about the education system and about our kids for, for, for hours <laughs> from the looks of it. Um, I want to come back to you because we talked about your education. So what, what were... What were the challenges in regards to that you faced? And when you look back at 47, getting that diagnosis and you look back and going, okay, well, that explains a lot in my past. What were the challenges and strengths that you saw in relation to, to the workplace and, and with managers and employers? Hey, listeners, I want to tell you about this wonderful app that I've been using called Focus Bear. Focus Bear is a productivity and health and well-being app designed by and for neodiversity professionals like you. The app works on PC, Mac, and mobile devices. I personally found Focus Bear so effective because they are designed by engineers who have a lived experience in being neodivergent. So what does Focus Bear do? Well, it removes all distractions and assists you in developing new habits. How? The app is completely customizable. You can set up multiple profiles to block various apps and sites with task-oriented focus. For example, you will be able to block all sites and apps but the word processing app, and you do so for two hours so you can focus on completing that task. What about the habit-forming assistance? Well, you set your days in three areas, morning, micro breaks, and afternoon. In each area, you want to form some new habits and you get to set the days and time durations for each habit. For example, in the morning, you want to meditate for five minutes, read for 10 minutes, and work out for 15 minutes. Focus Bear will block either all apps and websites and or allow select the apps you choose for each of those time durations. To further help motivate you in each of those sections, you can embed an inspiring video, like a 15-minute workout video that you can work out with. With my time using Focus Bear, I've been able to set block times of focus to complete tasks. And at the same time, I've been able to reestablish focus center habits and create new ones. 
The best part is I get to build those habits by being able to extend or shorten the timers. I encourage you to try Focus Bear to assist in getting focus and to build the habits you've always wanted. Personally, I'm a problem solver. I, we're good at problem solving. We can quickly think through something, analyze something. Um, I have a good feeling about people. I'm a good people analyzer. And generally, I call it the crystal ball. And some people go, well, how do you know that that's coming? I said, I just look at my crystal ball. And really, that's just, you know, experience and all of these other things working and going, oh, I've seen this before. And this is kind of the direction we're going to head. So, you know, neurodiversity is really a superpower to those who know how to harness it. And I was lucky. And I'm lucky. I, I was able to either advocate for myself or fake it to what the employer needed, uh, but yet still be a good performer. Like, you know, they require you to do eight hours worth of work. And I re remember this really specifically. I was hired to do this one job for eight hours a day for five days a week, right? That's what a job is. But I figured the job out. And I played a lot of solitaire and a lot of Minesweeper on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And on Friday, I took all the data from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and I worked like crazy on Friday. And I, you know, was a top performer at this particular company doing this particular job, but I really only worked for eight hours a week, maybe, may, maybe 10, right? I had to gather data before I could really do a good job, stellar job on Friday. If I had a lot of data, I started Thursday afternoon. But again, here's me faking it to my employer, but my employer not noticing that, you know, what's going on because I'm still outperforming everybody else in the end. So he didn't really care how I got there in the end. He was just like, you know, the results are sh show for themselves. Could we structure that job a little differently that I could have been, you know, super productive for 40 hours a week? Maybe. I doubt it. But, you know, that's just one instance of where, you know, that superpower comes in and, and where I get to use it. Now, as a manager, I get to advocate for the people that I see or that are either undiagnosed neurodivergence or undiagnosed um, anything or, or just slight personality changes. I, I we like to use Myers-Briggs and the DISC and the DISC assessment and the four personality, four quadrant personalities and things like that. And I really, and I use it as a tool to show people how to accept differences. I don't, you know, I don't necessarily buy into the whole perception because I believe that we have two personalities when we're at work. We have our natural personality and then we have the perceived personality that we put out, our fake, our imposter syndrome, we call it. Uh, and I think neurodivergents are great at being imposters because we have to, or we've been told that it's not good enough. It's not a good thing. These are all bad items. So we fake it. We have this imposter persona that we put out there for everybody else. Uh, and I, my, one of the things that I advocate as a manager is to educate people on differences so that we can get along and get higher production out. And, and I was good at that part. Right. So that's using the superpower, you know, as a as a manager. And now I'm teaching other managers how to use that as a as a coaching tool for them to use with their particular staff. Well, that's really interesting. Um, a number of things. I mean, I like how you worded that for those who know how to harness superpower. Um, and I think that's really key because many people may not or may even get offended at the term superpower because they may not see their their neodiversity as a superpower because of they haven't figured it out. They haven't learned how to harness it, as you put it. And it's also interesting, you know, what you described about kind of figuring things out in, in that example you gave. It, at the end of the day, it wasn't about working 40 hours. It's funny how, how employers and managers really insist that you have to be in the office because if they can't see you, you're not working. Where here you are in the office, they still can't see that you're not working, but they didn't matter because in the end, you got results. And they didn't care. I mean, I, 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 I would bet that they became aware, but at the end, they didn't care because you were getting results and you were outperforming everybody else. And, I, that, you know, and that comes out to, the, again, the, that result-based 
uh, ideology that doesn't matter where you work, how you work, when you work, as long as in the day you get the results. That's yeah. what really matters. Totally, totally. Because the other side of that is I could do that 100 by 100 mind sweeper in about three minutes, right? Like, <laughs> that's the other thing I learned at that job, man. I became a nine mind sweeper expert because I played so much of it. But again, yeah, you're absolutely right that the employer in the end just didn't. Um, and, and, and we have to think about that. And, and, and we're getting there. COVID, COVID did so many good things in that, in that we've got now these hybrid workplaces. And we have these, you know, people thinking about different ways that they can do their jobs remotely or in office or otherwise. And I think that what they're seeing is paying for the work that they produce, not paying for the hours they put in. And I think that that's what happens at when remote and, and there's a certain amount of people that are terrified of remote workers because they don't know if they're actually working or not. Well, if you're paying $80,000 for somebody to do a job and they do the job, is it worth 80,000 bucks? But oh no. So there's a little bit of a mental shift going on. Um, there's a lot of pushback in the, in the business community about remote work because again, like you stated, they can't see you putting in 40 hours a week. And there's a certain group of them that think that it's unfair that somebody can do, you know, that work. Luckily for me, I, I kind of had this little weird corner cubicle. Nobody really paid attention to me other than when I got to the coffee machine, right? Like, so I just kind of sat in the back corner and then every week, you know, Monday morning meeting would come out and, oh, look, Trevor put out the numbers again. The biggest part of fake, the biggest fakery was pretending to be on the phone <laughs> because of course that was part of the sales is being on the phone and, you know, they go, well, I never hear you on the phone except for on Fridays. And I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but your numbers look great. So keep it up. We don't good care. Job. <laughs> yeah, good job. Exactly. Right. So again, that's and 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 I think that there this whole thought process about being that other person, that that imposter syndrome. Some of us don't believe it's a superpower, but a lot of us have been mentally affected by the negative words and the negativity around being different. Why can't you be like Sally? Why can't you do this like this? Why can't this happen like that? So I think there's a lot of neurodivergence that have been beaten up to the point where um, they just don't know. I think there's a lot of anxiety and depression that go with neurodivergence. And I think that is lack of understanding. Um, and, and when people realize, you know, get to the understanding and, and create work environments, and that's what you're advocating, right? Work environments for those neurodivergents. I can't, you know, I've been working at home for the last two and a half years. I couldn't imagine going back nine to five. I just can't. I, it's just like, I don't know what I would do for nine to five. I, I mean, I get hyper-focused. Uh, yesterday, I learned how to do chat bots. I mean, these, these are things that we just kind of, I didn't, you know, I need a modified work week. You know, if I get inspiration at 10 o'clock at night and want to work until four in the morning, well, okay. Like, but my employer is not going to be okay with that. So I, I, again, teach, I, I spend a lot of time teaching diversity and, and teaching flexible workspaces, um, you know, 32 hour work weeks, you know, 24 hour work weeks. Let's, let's go to something. Let's go to four tens instead of eights. And let's, let's create flexibility for people in the workplace so that we can maximize their talents. Absolutely. And it, it goes to what you said earlier, you know, you're using analytical tools to teach employers and managers to understand the different types of people who they employ and how they think and how they perform differently and creating the environment that will support that. But that and that requires them to become adaptable. And that's definitely one of the, the, the huge challenges. But what we can see, though, that when it's done appropriately, it actually improves performance overall for the employer and the manager and the person or persons that they're managing. And <clears throat> coming back to the micro micromanagement, I want to say this and we'll move on to the next question. I mentioned in, in the beginning about attending a lot of webinars and particularly a lot of webinars are, are or in regards to the HR community, even though I'm not in HR, but what I do is HR related. And one of the webinars I was listening on, they had this fabulous HR professional who is a HR professional as well as university professor. And 
And he said something that that really blew me away. And I would try, I, I won't even try to pronounce his, his name. Um, my dyslexia would just kick in and, and, and it would be horrible. Um, but he said, managers, managers, if you're listening, and I hope you are, managers need to move away from micromanagement to micro understanding. So let's pause there for a moment. When we talk about micromanagement, Micromanagement is a byproduct of not trusting your team, your employees. Hence why we have micromanagement. So we need to move towards trusting and move all the way towards micro understanding to better manage and engage your teams, in particular, the neo-divergent talent that you are employing. Absolutely. It's about understanding. And I think the problem with Gen Xers specifically and and, and promotion and we can go into unionized crankiness as well. I mean, we can, we can go into this, but it becomes a, a, your 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 advancement in your career is based on your time on the job, not that you have a skill set to be a manager, but that oh, you've been here ten years, you should be a blank now. Right. And even though they don't have the skills for that job or ha- there's been no training mentioned or anything like that, we're going to promote you into this position uh, in Canada. It is it, there is no better example than our um, policing force, our RCMP. We have these people that, you know, oh, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a corporal. I'm a, I'm a sergeant. I'm a staff sergeant. I'm a this I'm a that. And they move up based on tenure. Very little of it has to do with skill. So when we get up in the ranks of lots of jobs, and, I, and I'm not going to pick on the RCMP specifically, but any job, we go move up in the ranks of those jobs, there's a certain amount of entitlement. This is the way I did it. This is the way I want you to do it. This is the way that it's always been done. And it's that sort of mentality that has to go away. So that micro understanding that you said, and it's a beautiful picture and word as to how that needs to be. Um, that's a hard thing to do in, in, in organizations where that's the culture. Mm. I talk about my, my hiring system, agile hiring, it's a value-based culture centric hiring system. And one of the values I promote is kindness and understanding and, and, and then put that in with some compassion because we need to understand who we have and what their superpowers are, as opposed to they've just been here 10 years, we're going to promote them. If their superpower is not people, then why are we, you know, having them lead people if that's not what they're really, really good at? And again, it's going to take a cultural shift. It's going to take within the company, within society in some cases, to really see this come through and I think that the Gen uh, Zers and the Zillennials are going to be the spear that forces that to mm. happen. And we talk about the understanding of neurodivergence and, and, and we talked about the education system. Well, let's talk about those Gen Zers for a sec. They are a product of this new education system of inclusivity, of, of collaboration. And, you know, when they go to school, they know what the day, the week, the semester is going to entail. They know what the parameters are. They work collaboratively a lot of the times. And then when they go into, and that's uh, neurodivergence as well, uh, you know, they go into the workforce to find that there's this weird rigidity in the Gen X generation. And they, that, and, and of course, good or bad, we as parents have been helicopter parenting. We do a lot for our children that our parents never did for us. We make sure they make every appointment. We make sure that they fill out every application. We make sure we do a lot of things for them. And I think generationally, when I graduated, it's here's your suitcase, there's the door, right? I mean, you're, it's time to move out, get a job and start going on your own. And parents knew that they were going to stumble. Now it's, we don't want you to struggle. You know, parents are supplying their children with down payments for homes. We don't have to work towards that. Um, I, you talk to a lot, number of Gen Zers, well, mom and dad is going to look after retirement for me too. Uh, you know, these things. I think that they're a little bit, they're stunted in, in their development because of that. Where I was 18 and it was like, there's the door and now you get a job and you learn to pay your bills and you learn to do banking and you make a bunch of mistakes and you run up a credit card and all, you know, all of these mistakes that we're going to make parents are insulating their children from that. So we don't 
have that same independence, I think, until 10 years later. I think we have 28 year olds that are like 18 year olds 30 years ago. Um, and, 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 and then there's that understanding again for the Gen Xers going, well, these, the snowflake generation, and now I really hate that term. And it's because they're not snowflakes. It's, it, they just, they've just lived in a world. And ironically enough, the Gen Xers created these children um, where yelling's not acceptable, collaboration's important, all of these. In, and so now we have a tradesperson yelling at a young apprentice and the young apprentice all of a sudden just doesn't show up one day. Well, well, that's a snowflake. No, 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 no. That's a generation problem. That's an understanding problem. And so when we talked about earlier that there's a lot of um, similarities between neurodivergence and the Gen Zs entering the workforce, I mean, that's where that comes in. It's lack of understanding, lack of micro understanding. Well, you've, you've really leapt into a number of questions I wanted to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> you've really gone ahead, which is fantastic. You've really given, you've given a definition that I was going to ask you in regards to how would you define the Gen Z's to Gen Xers? And you've painted that picture, you know, that w the Gen Xers were a generation that you were expected to be independent. Now this is a generation where things were planned out for you and you were given a path of where, where to go and, and how to accomplish that. And even if you were still trying to figure things out, these were the options that you could take to develop and grow in that area. And, the, and because they've grown up in that system, they're expecting, and, and I think rightly so, they're expecting that same system to be in the workplace because they want to know where they're going in that job. What's it going to lead to? What's my career direction? And, and because of that as well, as you stated, there, there's a 10 year gap, isn't there? You know, before they finally realize, okay, I've now established, now I can have my independence and, and, and how I'm going to buy my own house and buy another house down in, in the, in the, in the cottage region to, to be able to support myself and, and maybe pay back my parents for the retirement they've given me. <laughs> I, <doubt> it, but, <laughs> you know. I think, I think that 28 year old thing, I, it, again, it varies depending on the individual and it varies based on the confidence that they have. If you have a real neurodivergent, confident neurodivergent, and I would say I grew, I was lucky enough to have, be a confident neurodivergent. And so when I went into the world, I was confident in my superpower, even though I didn't label it. I just knew that, you know, I thought differently and there's some, some beauty in that. But I think for any Gen Zer, it's about confidence. Until they're confident of the situation, until they're really comfortable with that situation, they're not willing to make that next step. Mm. And that next step might be, you know, and if they're really not comfortable, they're just not going to show up. They're just not going to be there uh, for, for anybody. So uh, uh, for their employer, they're not going to be there. Um, and we've also taught them to be very self-aware. So again, culture is going to be really important for any company going forward, neurodivergent or Gen Z, because culture, you know, people want to be part of something greater. And because of the education system, because of the collaboration of the education, you know, that needs to be part of your collaboration within the workplace. It's not just shut up and do your job. That's not, that doesn't work anymore. It's, this is why you're here. This is what I want you to bring to the table. And this is what I want you to, 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 to create when you're here at your job. And in return, I'm going to pay you money for that. And I go back to my 16 year old. He just got a job a couple of weeks, been there for about a month. Today is the day that he works. And I said, you know what? Your employer has the job. You don't have a job. Your employer has a job, but they're going to pay you to show up and bring your skills to that job. And part of that skills is your attitude, the smile on your face and all of the other things. And you better be prepared. They're going to pay you pretty well. He's got a pretty, and it's a, a computer based teaching job. He's teaching older people how to use iPads and computers and stuff and fix their emails for a local library. And I said, your attitude is what they're going to pay you for. And if you don't show up with what your skills and, 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 and talents are, they're not going to, they're going to give your job, that job to somebody else that's going to show up. 
And so you better be prepared to do that job. You better be of the right mind and body to do that job. Be sure that you're fed, be sure that you're well slept and, and so that you're the, so that you're at the top of your game when you show up to that job. Uh, and so that, even that mind shift as to what, who has the job and what you bring to that job, again, is that micro understanding? Do you do, and, and, and it's, I think that's a, a confusion point for Gen Zers or neurodivergence entering the workplace is that's not clear, mm. right? I've, you know, I think saw a young lady that's just miserable at the checkout stand at the grocery store. And she hates her job. No, 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 no. She's just not loving. She, for whatever reason, she's not bringing her talents today to that job. I've seen her be a good cashier, but that day she was miserable. Um, again, it's just that micro understanding. Yeah. Um, I want to go back a little bit because, because what you described here relates to what you spoke about earlier. You know, when you said that, um, that neo-divergents have become very good at hiding. The terminology that's quite often used for that is masking. Mm -hmm. Neodivergents have become really experts at masking or hiding, as you put it. And and for those who who haven't really figured out their their superpower or become yeah yeah confident in, in their neodiversity, um, you mentioned again the anxiety, the, the 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 past treatment. I mean, the reality is is that there's a lot of trauma. I I can speak that from personal experience, even, you know, at this moment, there's a lot of trauma that I've experienced from bad employers, bad managers, bad teachers, bad classmates, you know, there's, there, there's trauma. And this relates towards the confidence issue. And before I get into the, one of the questions I want to get into, you, you, you spawned an, an interesting question, because you mentioned about the self-awareness that the Gen Z's are, are really self-aware. So would you say then, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing from, from what you described, and, and I'm wondering myself now from, from what you described, would you say then that Gen X are perhaps not as self-aware as the Gen Zs are? I just think we were told to bury it. <laughs> we were, I think we were told, you know, men aren't allowed to cry. You're not allowed to show emotion. You must be strong. You must be these things. We can go into mental men's mental health if you wish. But I think that's a generational thinking where our younger people are more, it's more acceptable in society today to be, or we wouldn't be talking about mental health and men's mental health specifically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think they're just, I think it's part of the cult. It's part of the generation. It's a part of the education. It's part of the all, all of that other stuff. We weren't allowed. It wasn't a per, we weren't permissed to have those, those feelings and we weren't allowed to, to show them out. And I, and I agree. We suffer trauma mm -hmm. uh, as 50 year olds. I can even say five years ago, I had a boss that didn't understand and it, I imploded. I totally imploded for 16 weeks. I imploded for weeks. I didn't get out of bed. Like mm. I had one, I want one person come to my house from my work and go, are you okay? And he's like, and he went, I don't even, didn't even recognize Trevor. He said like after the fact, like once I started getting better, but again, that's just trauma of lack of understanding and lack of understanding what the need was and the situation uh, situational awareness that was required there. And then the kindness and compassion that wasn't there either. I could have, <laughs> yeah, it, again, it's, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on right there. What's that all about? That's one of my favorite uh, lines when it comes to people that cry or are upset that, wow, that's a lot of stuff going on right there. What's that? Yeah, absolutely. So when we come back, you've touched on, a, on a quite a bit, you, you've touched on a, a nerve there. So when we navigate back to confidence and the trauma, and you, you've kind of painted a bit of a picture here in relation to neodiversity. So when we compare Gen Z neodivergence to Gen Z neotypical neo-majority, what would you say is the, the difference between the two groups? Mm. Wow, that's a good one. Because I think, you know, I've talked to other business owners that, you know, hire a variety. And I think that there's not a huge shift in the Myers-Briggs version of thinking. We still have Gen Zs that are, you know, drivers. We have Gen Zs that are logisticians. We have Gen Zs that are stable or, you know, S-types, uh, greens. And we have, you know, Gen Zs that are uh, 
eyes. They're they're creatives, right? I still think we have this, and and a lot of Gen Xers want to put them into the into the bottom green box. You're an S. You're you're a, you know you know a caring and all this and that. The next thing. I think again, it boils down to some more confidence and 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 micro understanding as to who you're dealing with, uh, understanding neurotypicals or neuro majorities. Are you're going to find that they're? I think, yeah, it's a it's a tough that's a tough question. I think I think we still have the the whole all the boxes are full. And again, I don't think the percentages are going to change that much. We might get a little bit of a higher percentage of people going below the line and they're more people oriented as opposed to task oriented. Um, and that's potentially there. Uh, but I think statistically, we still have a little bit of everybody in, in, in all four boxes, so to speak. Uh, so is it going to, you know, I think the hardest part for neurodivergence is again, communication and i and again that's a thing that gen xers don't do well and gen zers have been educated to talk a little more uh, that's why we talk about mental health that's why we communicate a little they're going to be a little bit better at communicating even though that they're you know addicted to iphones and computers and you know but they're still communicating at a rate that we never ever communicated um and, and I think that's where the Gen Xers kind of get left behind as they don't understand what that communication is all about. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. You've asked a really tough question. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm neurodiver- glad I finally stumped you. <laughs> <laughs> Neurodivergent <laughs> versus, I'm going to have to give that some thought. I'll get back to you on that one. Um, I mean, I'll tell you what I see in regards to at least similarities. When we take a look at Gen Zs and we take a look at neodiversity, they both want a career path. They both want further education and training. Uh, they both want to be supported, a coach, mentored, as well as getting that recognition. And I think in the similarity aspects, those are the two things that are very similar. And I think in both of those aspects, there is the aspect of the confidence that you've mentioned. I think the confidence that you've pointed out, I personally think is one of the crucial elements that isn't talked about a lot or at all. At there, are all. Many things, there are many things that are talked about, but confidence is not one of them. And ironically, when I think about it, I've been talking about it, but I haven't, I haven't pinned it down as just confidence. And I have, which I've talked about in this podcast before, is the ability formula. And what's what is ability equal? Ability equals competence plus confidence. So competence, you, know, you, you need to become competent to build the confidence. Then confidence, then it's conf- competence plus confidence plus wins. You need to have the wins. You need to get the recognition to further build your confidence. And then comes the next element, which is self-esteem. So when you build proper confident, competence, you build your confidence. When you have enough wins, that builds your self-esteem. And that's the ability formula. But to simplify that, as you have, it all comes down to confidence. And I think when it comes to both those groups, neotypical Gen Zs and neodiversity Gen Zs, it, or neodivergent Gen Zs, should I say, there's a confidence factor. And I think one of the, which we've talked about through this whole entire podcast, for me, I would say the biggest issue is not that the neotypicals or neo-majority doesn't go through that. I would say though the neo-divergence, depending on their structure, depending on, on their community, they go through it more. It's the trauma factor. That labeling, that stigma, that interferes with them building the confidence. And part of that, the next step to that is the aspect of, are we creating the right environments to build that confidence? Well, if we stick a child in a a neotypical rigid school system where teachers in the system is not going to adapt, that's going to cause trauma. That's going to have an impact on their confidence. So I would say those are the two, two particular distinct differences um, that I see 
in regards to that question. And, and I totally agree. And and I, you know, I, again, I've been lucky that I've had a confidence as a neurodivergent that 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 has never really been it wasn't labeled and i never took it as a label i brushed it off and i went you guys don't know what you're talking about and i've got and and i and i was self-aware at such an early age at 17 right like um and when i talked to and my son my 16 year old now lives primarily with me because even his mom doesn't quite understand Right. He just needs that little extra understanding for cons- confidence in his in his in his superpower. Um, I think neurodivergence, depending on the environment, it's going to be depending on that environment, whether that was an acceptable thing to be neurodivergent or not. Will uh, you know, because if you think about it in a perfect world, that neurotypical was raised in a confident world and was true is taught that you are not broken you are just wired different run with that understand that harness that take it for all it's worth and grow that i think they're going to outpace the neurotypicals because the neurotypicals are waiting to be told what's going to happen and the neurodivergents are going to be i'm confident that i will figure it out and so but what are we what you know what are the percentages of that I don't know. And how can we, how can employers, I can't, I, you know, putting neurotypical neuro, neurodivergent aside, putting it aside, when I explain to a Gen X owner, they just lack confidence. And I give that example that they are 10 years behind you in that independence because you, and, and then it, the light turns on the palm hits the forehead things at the lower levels change you know onboarding changes okay this is what's going to happen on your first day this is going to happen in your first week this is and this is what we expect from you here are the targets here are your easy wins here are your and it builds that confidence and but i think what gen zers are really good at is smelling a rat (laughs) they know when it's wrong and they're going to know it's wrong long before you've kind of exposed your flaws in your company and your company culture towards what you've told them that they're going to receive and what they are receiving. If you, again, this is where I, you know, agile hiring is a shift in how to hire in this day and age, specifically around Gen Z and neurotypical, neurodivergent, neurotypical aside Gen Z, um, if you don't overhaul your whole system and if you just try to overhaul the beginning part to get them in the door, to get them hired, you're going to find that you're going to have an incredible amount of turnover because they're not going to, they're not buying your culture. They're not buying your training. They're not buying your, your preparedness They're You know, the, what you sold them isn't what's going to happen. And they're going to call you on that by just not showing up that, you know, they're just not going to turn around. They're just not going to come here. They're just like, they're, I, I'm done here. Or they're going to quietly quit. My son did that. He just quietly quit, just slowly did it until they just fired him. <laughs> um, yeah, and and that's just kind of what they're going to do. But yeah, it, well, it comes down to what we discussed to the whole podcast is the system in what in, in the system and how they were raised. And part of the system how they were raised was you know was based on value. So now they enter the workplace, and if the workplace is not following a system based on values, then yeah, they're going to quiet quit. They're going to call them out. They're going to say that I will work here until I find a place that meets my standards, or I don't care if I have nothing to, to, to back me up. I'm just going to quit. Well, they work in a gig economy. A lot of them have three jobs anyways. If they quit one, they're really, the effect is really low, right? They're hustling, right? Uh, As Gary V puts it, everybody has a hustle and they have a hustle. It's, it's, it's that value-based system. And, and a lot of companies don't have and don't live by the values that are written on their wall. And, and that's the I, problem. I, I always make the joke, the managers and the owners got together one time and created a mission, vision, value statement. And then they told everybody what it was. And then they put it on the wall and it was never talked about again. And, and that's, that's the truth, that's, isn't it? That's the, that's the way 99% of it happens. I, I called one company out. They have 50 employees. I asked one of the employees. I said, what are the values of this company? I don't know. I don't know. I said, so then how do you know how to act 
towards your customers? And how do you know how to, well, um, uh, Curtis over here, my, my manager tells me that, all right, so now we're running off of Curtis's values as he's interpreted the company, right? And that's, and that's if you don't eat, sleep and breathe mission, vision, value as an owner, your managers and those training your front office, your front frontline staff, that's where the values are coming from. And if those guys are a little bit janky, well, you're going to have a lot of fun turnover. Uh, again, I have worked with a company that had that, had a manager that was less, less lacked integrity. Let's just put it that way. Well, you can and, us, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, it, it, it just, it rippled through and it caused problems. And it was all of these other things because they weren't, and integrity was one of their mission, vision values, but they didn't hire this person through the mission, vision value. Again, it was just a corporate, a corporate thing that just happened. And then if they would have called this guy on it, how on his integrity, every time it lacked, he would have been out years ago. Instead, they kept him for 18 years and caused havoc. That's a funny thing though, isn't it? Is that, is that, Companies know who who the bad managers are, and, and if not the if not the higher ups, definitely their HR knows. I once attended a a, a webinar uh, where an HR consultant for other companies talked to the the internal HRs and tell me tell me tell me who your bad managers are, and each and every single one of them in different companies could name them and count them on their hand. And then you ask yourself, well, they know they're a problem. Why is why they're not doing anything about them? Why are the higher ups not doing anything about them? And it comes back for me, anyhow, it comes back to the values of the company. There's something wrong with the values of the company. Now, Trevor, you've given us quite a lot of segments in regards to your coaching sure. and what you do. And with that said, can you give us a more fuller picture of how you transform business leaders? It is through education and understanding. I believe a lot of business leaders didn't plan on becoming business leaders. They started out something else before they were business leaders. They were pharmacists or biologists or plumbers or uh, any a myriad of any other designations. Um, and then they decided that they were going to go into business for themselves and have employees and inventory and all of these other things. And that wasn't their original intention. They didn't go to school to become business majors. They didn't go get an MBA. They didn't do it. They just went, you know what? I'm tired of doing this. And I think typically a lot of neurodivergents become business owners because they can't handle the rigidity of their bosses and they quit and I can do a better job than them. I've learned everything I can. And so I think that there's a lot of owners out there that are also neurodivergent that need help. And how do I transform it? I start at the basics. What don't you know? We have, if you're an unintentional business owner, you have gaps in your knowledge. And a lot of those gaps revolve around HR. And when we settle into your mission, vision, value, and I talk about your way, if you're the peaks and valleys way of doing coaching. It is based on my values. It's based on my mission, vision, value. And when a company embraces their way of doing business and they gain good employees, they'll gain good clients, they'll, they'll work with good vendors because there's this culture-centric value alignment that happens throughout everything they do. It's easy to make a decision. It's not hard. When you just have to go, are we going to use this vendor? Well, they want us to pay half in cash and half for this. And well, they lack integrity. And integrity is one of our values. So we're not going to do business with them. We're going to go do business with this other company that in you know has a very intentional way. There's no side deals. There's no nothing, right? It's just then the business becomes easy. Business should be boring. And that's, I think, the problem that neurodivergents have a problem with is they get into it and it's a boom. It's a lot of excitement at the beginning. And then it gets really boring and it should be boring. It should be, should be, should be very day to day. We should know exactly kind of what it is. So that's where I start. And it's usually in the people that the problem is. Nine out of 10 business problems are people problems, whether that's your customers, whether it's your vendors or whether it's your employees. I pick on employees because I believe that there is the shift with neurodivergence and Gen Zers. 
And I think that there's, if the faster a company pivots, the more successful they're going to be um, typically. And, and that's what I want to see. But then I also get in, it usually opens up a Pandora box of other things. I recently worked with a, a customer, client of mine for six months, husband's neurodivergent, wife's neurotypical. The business was having some problems. They didn't know their mission, vision, value. They ended up firing their general manager and they ended up firing their bookkeeper. There were some problems. The wife had to step in and she was bitter about it because the neurodivergent uh, owner, her husband, their co-owners, but he didn't see it. He didn't fix it. He didn't, he didn't do this. So there was some resentment in there. Well, then my own experiences come into play and it's going, I need you guys to remember that it's you and your husband against the problem, not against each other. And we uh, gave her some bigger understanding to what neurodivergence is. She called me one time, I'm so angry. He's doing this and he should be doing that. And I'm like, okay, that, that he's shutting down for whatever reason, right? Like I, I could explain, I could, I could, um, translate <laughs> for her neurotypical versus neurodivergent. Uh, but what's happened since six months working with me, they went from a minus 5% profit, which is actually way low to plus 20, plus 25, depending on what month we were in. Everybody's on the same page. The new employees are in the right direction. I gave some tools on how to work with the neurodivergent owner and, and how to maximize what he does. Make him the teacher and let him be the fixer of the problems instead of, and, 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 and let him do what his superpower allows him to do. He can diagnose things like crazy because that's what his brain allows. And once we got past that, the, the whole company moved forward, moved up and moved forward to, to a profitability, to, to simplicity. Instead, she literally runs the company from the office by herself. No more general manager, no more uh, bookkeeper, no more of this. She just, the company, the, from her perspective, the business is boring now. It's, it's predictable. And it just, it only took us six months to get there. It took us every week for six months and sometimes twice a week for six months. And they were committed, but we got there and they've taken the summer off and I go back to working with them in the fall. And they're like, I think we're good. I think we're going to work with you every two weeks now and see how that works. And we're going to, we're going to just massage some of the, the things into, into, into more boring. Um, but, but that's typical of, of what I do is identify. And a lot of it has to do with our values. It's just, if we can adjust our values, the rest becomes clear. It just clears everything up. It's crazy. It actually, it's kind of this beautiful thing and it'll clear it up for the neurodivergent. Well, that's fantastic. You, you, you really give a really good explanation of what you do. And you told a really fantastic story of how you've actually helped somebody. And by giving that story, you've painted all the elements for someone to understand what you do, how you do it, and the outcome of it, how you actually helped somebody and how they benefited from what you're able to accomplish. So then, Trevor, how can my audience get in touch with you? Well, I mean, I'm on all the socials. And I have a website, www.pvsbd, Peaks Valley Strategic Business Development.ca, pvsbd.ca. Um, my program for hiring is called Agile Hiring, and you can go to agilehiring.ca, www.agilehiring.ca, and you can find me there. You'll find some nice videos on YouTube if you go to Peaks and Valleys, LinkedIn under Trevor Brunches, YouTube under Peaks and Valley, or, uh, Sorry, in a Facebook, Peaks and Valleys, Instagram, Peaks and Valleys. You'll find me under Peaks and Valleys. But Trevor Brunches, uh, business coach, British Columbia. Probably it'll come up on Google too. I got a Google page. I mean, I'm literally, I should be pretty easy to find if you really start to look for me. But uh, And, and uh, out of all that, what's, what's, what's one key uh, contact sphere? that it's best to reach you at? Is it the LinkedIn? Get, is it the website? Get me, on it... link, get me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn every day. I, I pretty much, it's it's where I do a lot of my business. It's where I find a lot of my clients. And I'm not just a Canadian coach. I work with people all over the place. I work with people in the UK. I work with people uh, in the States. I work with people in Canada. Um, I would love to work with people all over the world because I think that 
people are people are people. I think the problem persists all over. Yeah, we might have some some, some cultural differences from place to place, but let's go through those together and let's 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 figure this out. Fantastic. And lastly, Trevor, as I stated earlier, we covered quite a lot of things in regards to neodiversity, Gen Zs, Gen Xers, the workplace, the education system. So my last question to you then is, can you give me three key pieces of advice from everything that we've said that you would say on why employers should embrace neodiversity inclusion? Three key points for neodivergent inclusion you're going to be able to harness somebody's superpower if you have that micro understanding of who that person is. And we need visionaries and we need doers in business. And so embracing a superpower, I think, is number one uh, for a neurodivergent in a workplace. Uh, Two, I think... You know, in a workplace, I think employers need that micro understanding. I think that's a huge thing for them to understand what they have and make accommodations to make that flourish. I think that's a huge key point that people miss is how do we, where do we create the environment for that to grow? And third is value. If you value, depending on what your values are, if you don't have kindness, compassion, and inclusivity, all of these things somehow tied into your value package, it needs to be there generationally and for the neurodivergence of the world. We're in, we're in an era of understanding, inclusivity. And if you don't embrace that as a small, medium and embra- a business owner, it's, you're going to be left behind. You're going to find yourself without employees because they don't want to work. I think it's, it's going to be a half to for business owners to have that inclusivity. Absolutely amazing, Trevor. Absolutely amazing. So, well, Trevor, we've touched on, once again, a number of key points. And I want to thank you for being such an amazing guest. As always, listeners, I will put today's guest contact details in the show notes. Hey, listeners, I encourage you to continue supporting this podcast so I can bring you more amazing content. You can do so by visiting my Patreon page, where you can connect with me more directly with several options. Till next time, take a leap and transform.